pulling an over 300 ton boat up a hill, hypnotizing actors for a film, and eating his own shoe? It doesn't get any wilder than Werner Herzog, a director with no limits. The very embodiment of they don't make them like they used to where the ideas for his films are crazy, but the stories behind the scenes are even crazier. A director that really pushes the boundaries of filmmaking and follows no rules when doing so, instead making his own. But as critically acclaimed as Werner Herzog is, we wanted to put more of a focus on the stories that make him such a fascinating and controversial person. The stories that not only add to his character, but enrich his films as well. There are many videos out there that dive deep into his style of filmmaking, but this will be more of an overview of all the wild, weird, and sometimes controversial things that happen throughout his career. Also note that we'll touch a bit on his experiences with Klaus Kinski, but for an in-depth video on those, check out our Klaus Kinski video if you haven't already. Werner Herzog is a German director and a pioneer of new German cinema. His career began in the early 60s and he has since racked up a catalog of 20 feature films, 34 documentary features, and some short films and TV episodes on top of this. Although critically acclaimed in his early feature film work with the likes of Aguirre, The Wrath of God, Fitzcarraldo, and Stroszek, he has since lost his form in this medium. Unlike with documentaries where he has excelled in his whole career with hits like Grizzly Man, Lessons of Darkness, and Encounters at the End of the World. And Excelled is an understatement, as almost every documentary of his is held to high regard, making him one of the greatest documentary filmmakers. He also had many roles in acting and voice acting, like in The Mandalorian as The Client. His films usually center around conflict with nature, ambitious protagonists with impossible dreams, or people with unusual talents. He often finds some of the most interesting places and people to make films and documentaries about. But I don't think any of them are as interesting as Herzog himself, which you'll soon see. Born as Werner Stipetich in Munich, Germany in 1942, his mother moved them to the remote Bavarian village of Sachrang after their neighbor's house was destroyed during an Allied bombing raid. Herzog's first childhood memory was of the city Rosenheim on fire after an Allied bombing raid in 1945, which his mother showed him and his brother so they could witness why they had to move to such a remote village. In Sachrang, they had no running waters, no phone, no toys, no tools. He didn't even know cinema existed until a traveling projectionist came by the village. At 12 years old, Herzog and his family moved back to Munich. Herzog then adopted his father's surname, thinking it sounded better for a filmmaker translating to Duke in German, even though his father abandoned them early in his life. In high school, he already knew he wanted to be a filmmaker. So he learned the basics from a few pages in an encyclopedia and stole the Munich Film School's 35mm camera, the same one he used for Aguirre, The Wrath of God. Before making Aguirre, The Wrath of God in 1972, Herzog first made a few feature films, short films, and documentaries. During his last years of high school, no production companies wanted to take on his projects, so he funded his first featurettes by working night shifts as a welder in a steel factory. His first official short film, Heracles, released in 1962. Two years later, he made a second short film, Game in the Sand, which was never published or viewed publicly. The 14-minute short involved four children and a rooster in a cardboard box. There was a scene with a chicken buried in sand up to its neck, and there's not much else known about it. Herzog said he'll never release it in his lifetime as the filming got out of hand, which forced him to abandon the project. Even Dwarves Started Small might have been Herzog's most controversial film released. The plot? Dwarves confined in an institution rebel against the guard and director. The film then went on to mock politics and present many controversial topics that got animal activists, white supremacists, and religious people all riled up. It even got to the point where Herzog received death threats and apparently had to rent cinemas himself to screen the film. And the making of this film wasn't smooth sailing either. During a scene where a van drives in circles on its own, an actor was run over by it but surprisingly stood up and was uninjured. The van driving in circles on its own was inspired by when Herzog worked at Munich's Oktoberfest as a steward that ensured no one drunk attempted to drive home. To stop those who insisted on driving, Herzog would get into the car with them, full lock the steering wheel to one side, and get out of the car, leaving the car to drive in circles until it ran out of gas. <laughs> what a job. The same actor that was run over also caught on fire during the flower burning scenes, sustaining minor injuries. It got to the point where Herzog promised that if the actors made it through the rest of filming without any more injuries, he'd jump into a cactus patch while being filmed. Luckily and unluckily for him, no more injuries occurred and Herzog went through with the bet saying that getting out was a lot more difficult than jumping in. During the making of this film, Herzog also gave unusual stage directions to get very peculiar performances. One example of this was when he was directing a person of short stature who had a hard time not laughing and was constantly being told by Herzog not to laugh. 
But then Herzog made funny faces at him the moment they started filming. In 1971, Herzog released his documentary, Fata Morgana, which was filmed over 13 months from 1968 to 1969. The film consisted of many tracking shots, capturing mirages in the Sahara and Sahel deserts. At the time of filming, Herzog had no idea how the footage would be used and was originally going to use it for a science fiction film. The filming of this documentary came with a lot of problems. The crew encountered sandstorms and floods and had to halt filming after being forced to abandon all their equipment and their truck at a border crossing. While in Cameroon, they were imprisoned because their cameraman had a similar name to a German mercenary who was sentenced to death and hiding from authorities. Even Herzog himself was thrown into a rat-infested jail where he was beaten and contracted Bilharzia, a parasitic blood disease. About this production, Herzog said that it forced real life, genuine life, into the film. The film was seen as one of the first European art house psychedelic films, described as a hallucination, with images from it reappearing in Herzog's later movies. A year later in 1972, we'd get what some call Werner Herzog's best film, Aguirre, The Wrath of God, which was the first of his five Klaus Kinski collaborations. The film is an epic historical drama that takes place in the 16th century and follows a group of conquistadores in the Amazon River in search of El Dorado, a legendary city of gold. Kinski played the lead role of Aguirre who leads the group and filming took place in the Peruvian rainforest in Machu Picchu and on the Amazon River. Herzog described writing the screenplay in a frenzy within 2.5 days during a 200 mile bus trip with his football team. After winning a game, his teammates got drunk and vomited on a few of his pages, having to throw them out the window and later not remembering what was on them. Filming took five weeks and the 35 millimeter camera that Herzog stole from the Munich Film School was used. Many years later, he recalled that it was a very simple 35 millimeter camera, one I used on many other films, so I do not consider it a theft. For me, it was truly a necessity. I wanted to make films and needed a camera. I had some sort of natural right to this tool. If you need air to breathe and you are locked in a room, you have to take a chisel and hammer and break down a wall. It is your absolute right. On the topic of the relationship between Herzog and Kinski, we won't go into too much detail on their many conflicts since we have a full video about it, but it started with an hour of inaudible screaming to accept the role, followed by arguments with how to portray the character and how to film the opening shot, followed by constant rants, sometimes hours long and inches away from Herzog's face. Oh, and Kinski also flailed a sword at extras, shot at a hut filled with extras during after hours, and was about to quit and leave the location until Herzog threatened to kill him if he did so. So if you wanna hear more about all that craziness, check out our video about Klaus Kinski. One trait of Herzog film productions is that he places the cast and crew in similar situations as the characters in his film. This was very apparent in Aguirre, where they had the cast and crew actually float on locally built rafts down the Huayaga and Anai River rapids, climb up mountains, and go deep into the thicker regions of the jungle directly mirroring the explorer's journey in the film. They even experienced a storm that caused the river to flood and cover the film set with a few feet of water and destroyed the rafts built for the film. The flood was added into the story where shots of the flood and rebuilding of the rafts are seen. And for the climactic scene at the end involving many monkeys on the raft, Herzog paid many locals to trap 400 monkeys. He paid half in advance and would pay half when he received them, but the trappers sold the monkeys to someone in America. But just as the monkeys were being loaded and shipped out of the country at the airport, Herzog came in pretending to be a veterinarian, claiming the monkeys needed vaccination before they can leave. The monkeys were handed over to Herzog, who used them for this scene and later released them back into the jungle. During this period, he also released these feature films, these short films, and these documentaries. And in the winter of 1974, after hearing about the impending death of his friend Lot H. Eisner, Herzog set out on a three-week pilgrimage. He walked on foot from Munich to Paris through cold temperatures and snowstorms, believing that this act of devotion would prolong her life. Herzog's diary during the pilgrimage was published as Of Walking on Ice, and Eisner would go on to live till 1983. In 1976, Werner Herzog made another hit, Heart of Glass. But this time, he might have gone a little too far to get some weird performances out of the cast. Herzog hypnotized every single actor except for the lead and the glass blowers in the film. All these actors performed their scenes while being hypnotized, with Herzog's intention being to give a trance-like state to the townspeople in the story. The dialogue was memorized during hypnosis, mostly provided by Herzog while being hypnotized, but the actors also made spontaneous gestures and movements as a side effect that would be used in the film as well. And this isn't the only instance of Herzog and hypnosis, as he also likes to hypnotize chickens. 
He clarified his method on a Reddit AMA where he told users to put the chicken's beak on the floor and then draw a line of chalk away from it. There are many videos of this method online and it's pretty crazy, so definitely check it out. We'll leave a link in the description. And I said he likes to hypnotize chickens because he seems to have something against them. A famous quote of his about them was, the enormity of their stupidity is just overwhelming. You have to do yourself a favor when you're out in the countryside and you see a chicken. Try to look a chicken in the eye with great intensity. And the intensity of stupidity that is looking back at you is just amazing. A year later, Herzog released Stroshek, that is another one of his best films. The film was written in four days and there wasn't anything too controversial with this film's production. Other than that, he planned to meet up with Errol Morris, a documentary filmmaker, to dig up the grave of an infamous killer and body snatcher's mother, but Morris never showed up, which I don't blame him. That same year, he released the documentary short La Souffriere. And it was the making of this film that I think is the wildest thing Herzog has done, other than collaborating with Kinski five times. Herzog and his crew went to the island of Guadeloupe that had just been evacuated due to an impending volcanic eruption. When Herzog heard that a man refused to leave the island, he knew he wanted to find out what kind of relationship the man had with death. The documentary has them exploring the empty towns of the island and up to the caldera where clouds of smoke and sulfurous steam drifted to the skies. The island was completely empty other than Herzog, his crew, and three different men he found that stayed behind that he interviewed. One was waiting for death, even showed his position for it, and another stayed back to look after the animals. Luckily for everyone though, the volcano didn't erupt and Herzog could go on to make more critically acclaimed films. One of which was Nosferatu the Vampire, which released in 1979 and was his second collaboration with Kinski. There wasn't too much Kinski drama for this movie other than the usual rants, but Herzog received some backlash for animal cruelty involved with the film. One of the best scenes involved having 11,000 rats released publicly in the city streets. Delft, Netherlands, where most of the filming took place, was against filming this scene there, so production had to be moved to the nearby city of Skidam. Herzog hired a Dutch behavioral biologist for his expertise with laboratory rats who ended up quitting soon after he witnessed how inhumane the rats were being treated. One reason was the extremely poor traveling conditions of the rats who were being transported from Hungary and began to eat each other by the time they arrived in the Netherlands. The other reason was that Herzog insisted on dyeing the white rats gray by submerging the cages of rats in boiling water for several seconds, which caused half of them to die. The ones that did survive ended up licking the dye off themselves as the biologist predicted would happen. According to the biologist, the horses and sheep for the film were also treated poorly, but he didn't go into detail on this. I think that this was one of the more darker and controversial Herzog moments and one that he probably regrets when looking back. And there's only one way to come back from this, and that's eating your own shoe. In 1978, filmmaker Errol Morris released his first film the documentary Gates of Heaven, after Herzog made a bet that he'd eat his own shoe if Morris ever actually finished a film. Being a man of his word, Herzog ate one of his shoes at a Berkeley, California theater in 1979. He did this in front of an audience while Les Blank filmed it, later releasing it as a short film in 1980 titled Werner Herzog Eats His Shoe. Herzog claimed that this was the shoe he was wearing when he made the bet, and he gave a speech about how this act should encourage aspiring filmmakers to get the job done. The shoe was boiled with herb and garlic for five hours by a chef before being consumed. He didn't eat the sole of the shoe, however, as he explained that you wouldn't eat the bones of a chicken. Pretty good logic there. During this period, Herzog also released Wojzek, his third collaboration with Kinski, No One Will Play With Me, and these documentaries. Every man should pull a boat over a mountain once in his life. A famous quote by Werner Herzog related to the difficult feat he accomplished while making one of his most beloved films, Fitzcarraldo. It also had one of the most chaotic film productions ever. This was his fourth collaboration with Klaus Kinski, who played Fitzcarraldo, a man who wanted to build an opera house in the Peruvian Amazon and needed to transport his steamship over a steep hill to reach the richer part of the Amazon basin. And the behind the scenes didn't differ much from the plot as Herzog and the crew actually transported the 320 ton steamship over the hill, no special effects. Herzog believed that no one ever did something similar in history and that no one will ever again, giving himself the title of conquistador of the useless. And he's probably right that no one ever did this as even the real Fitzcarraldo didn't as his ship was only 32 tons and was disassembled before being moved. So how the heck did they get the 320 ton steamship up the 40 degree slope in one of the most dangerous places on earth? Well, it was with the help of hundreds of extras and a Brazilian engineer who designed an advanced pulley system. The extras hired were mostly indigenous people, something he also did for Aguirre. There were accusations that Herzog exploited these indigenous people with the amount of work they were put through. The production was filled with complications on top of the injuries from transporting the boat. There were two small plane crashes transporting people to the location, resulting in five injuries with one being paralyzed. 
A lumberman cut off his own leg after being bit by a venomous snake. And a group of scavenging tribespeople launched a raid on the film's production camp, hitting two people with arrows in their throat and stomach. The film's production camp was a makeshift village they constructed that contained a very limited amount of food and medical supplies for the cast and crew. To keep the crew's morale high, Herzog brought a lot of prostitutes to keep at the camp. And it seemed to work as one of the prostitutes helped Thomas Mauck, the cinematographer, calm down a little while undergoing hours of improvised surgery without anesthetics after his hand was torn apart. Her technique? Burying Mauck's head between her breasts. The injury happened during the scene where the ship was crashing through violent rapids. Three of the six people involved with filming were injured as the ship was out of control. The production was so riddled with issues that it got its own documentary about the difficulties with making the film, the very well-received Burden of Dreams by Les Blank. And aside from all the issues mentioned so far, there were still all the problems with Kinski, who only got the role after their original lead, Jason Robards, became ill after 40% of his scenes were completed. Kinski's rants during filming were cranked up to 11, always going on tantrums whenever he wasn't the center of attention, which for a film with this many issues, he often wasn't. These violent outbursts disturbed the indigenous actors to the point where the chief offered to kill Kinski for Herzog, to which Herzog replied, no, I still need him for shooting, leave him to me. This movie is known as one of the most infamous film productions, maybe only beaten by Apocalypse Now. For the rest of the millennium, Herzog put much more focus on his documentaries. He only released these three films, including his fifth and final collaboration with Kinski, Cobra Verde, where their conflicts with one another peaked and Herzog vowed to never work with Kinski again. But he released all these documentaries during this time. The best of this bunch is Lessons of Darkness, which explores the oil fields on fire in post-Gulf War Kuwait. Although being recognized as 1992's most memorable documentary, the film was viewed as controversial in some festival screenings because Herzog aestheticized the horror of war. Herzog went on to deny that these were his intentions. He also released My Best Fiend in 1999 that's about his relationship and all his collaborations with Klaus Kinski who passed away in 1991. Little Dieter Needs to Fly and Wings of Hope both had Herzog getting people to relive their past trauma. Little Dieter Needs to Fly followed the life of Dieter Dengler, who was a Vietnam war pilot that was shot down and captured as a POW. After being tortured and starved, Dengler managed to escape and get rescued. The wild part of this documentary was that Herzog had Dengler relive the situation he was in. They revisited the jungle three decades later, had Dengler walk through the trees with his hands bound and Herzog even hired men to play the captors. Dengler trusted Herzog as a friend and was comfortable enough to relive this trauma and share his story. Dengler's story was later made into the feature film Rescued Dawn starring Christian Bale and directed by Herzog. In Wings of Hope, Herzog had Julian Kopka reliver past trauma who at the age of 17 was the sole survivor of the Peruvian flight Lanza Flight 508 that was struck by lightning and disintegrated mid-air in 1971. After surviving, she then traveled in the jungle on foot for 10 days, eventually finding a small village where she was helped. For the documentary, Herzog and Kopka took the same flight but with a different airline. They sat in the same seat as she did during the crash and then walked through the jungle, even visiting the crash site where parts of the wreckage remain. The reason Herzog was so interested in this story was because he was actually supposed to be on that flight to do location scouting for Aguirre, the Wrath of God, but his reservation got canceled last minute after a change in his itinerary. The 2000s had Herzog continue to release great documentaries, but he slowed down a bit with his narrative films, even releasing a few that were panned by critics. In 2005, he released one of his best documentaries to date, Grizzly Man. The film follows two bear enthusiasts, Timothy Treadwell and his girlfriend Amy, who for many summers had studied bears at the Katmai National Park in Alaska. They camped out all summer in an effort to study and protect the bears from poachers. They tried to show that bears were not a threat, but on October 5th, 2003, they were killed by one. Those summers were thoroughly documented by the two of them with video and audio recordings, including their death. For the making of this documentary, Herzog was given over 100 hours of video footage filmed by Treadwell during the last five years of his life. He even listened to the unreleased audio recording of Treadwell's death that was kept by Treadwell's ex-girlfriend, who never listened to it herself and never plans to. The documentary featured Herzog listening to this audio where you can see how distressed and shocked he was. He then advised Treadwell's ex to destroy the tape so that it would stop tempting her and so that she'd never actually listen to it. While promoting Grizzly Man, Herzog's wife took a photo of him with a grizzly bear right behind him. About the photo, he said, she was worried about my safety, but I couldn't care less. I only disliked the situation because the bear was so close that I could smell his very foul breath. It's a very foul breath, so I didn't like that, but that's the only thing. And then he dropped a classic Herzog quote that helps explain his bold style of filmmaking. I'm not that interested in whether I perish or not. It would be a very minor significance. 
A year later, in 2006, he released the narrative film Rescue Dawn that tells the story of Dieter Dengler starring Christian Bale. Dangerous stunts needed to be performed for this film. Herzog often wanted to partake in them himself whenever the crew disapproved of them. Hollywood has become a lot more regulated than it was back in the Fitzcarraldo days, but Herzog still didn't follow the rules too much. This included having Bale spun around upside down so much due to a language barrier that he couldn't stand up straight for three days. Oh, and also having Bale eat live maggots. But in both of these cases, Herzog offered to do it himself. There were also two wild Herzog stories that occurred in 2006 that were not part of film productions. In a 2006 interview with the BBC about Grizzly Man outside in LA, Herzog randomly got shot by an air rifle. Herzog was very calm when this happened, and after they retreated to a studio to check it out, Herzog revealed a bruise with blood, to which Herzog laughed off and said, it's not significant. Who shot him and the reasons for doing so are still unknown. The other wild story was that in 2006, Joaquin Phoenix flipped his car in Hollywood and decided to light a cigarette while still in the vehicle. This was a bad idea as gas was leaking into the car. But lo and behold, a wild Werner Herzog appeared. He tapped on the windshield of the upside down car to get Phoenix's attention and then smashed a the window open. When retelling the story, Phoenix said that there was a German voice saying, just relax. There's something so calming and beautiful about Werner Herzog's voice. I felt completely fine and safe. But when Phoenix came out of the car to thank him, Herzog was already gone. What an absolute mad lad. In 2010, he released the documentary Cave of Forgotten Dreams, which is about the Chauvet Cave in Southern France. It contains some of the oldest human painted images discovered, with some dating back to 32,000 years ago. The cave has been sealed off to the public since 1994, but Herzog and his crew were given permission for six days of filming, four hours each day due to near toxic levels of radon and carbon dioxide. They had to wear special suits and shoes that have not been worn outside, and Herzog was only allowed to bring a four-person crew with him. Their equipment had to be battery-powered, and their lights could not give off excess heat, and the crew had to stay on a two-foot-wide walkway without touching any of the cave walls or floor. To make matters even more difficult, they were filming it in 3D, since it was 2010 and everything had to be 3D back then. The 3D cameras were custom-built for this film production and often had to be assembled inside the cave. But Herzog and the crew pulled through and got all the footage they needed. The film was to premiere at TIFF, the Toronto International Film Festival on Monday, September 13th, 2010, and would be the Bell Lightbox Theater's first 3D film screened. But by Wednesday before the debut, only 30 of the film's 89 minutes were complete. Luckily, they were able to finish it in time, only for the digital projectors to jam five minutes from the end during the screening. Since the year 2000, he also released these films and these documentaries. Special shout outs to Encounters at the End of the World, The White Diamond, Into the Abyss, and into the inferno. In 2009, after being dissatisfied with the way film schools are being run, Herzog founded the Rogue Film School. Herzog said that academia is the death of cinema. It is the very opposite of passion. Film is not the art of scholars, but of illiterates. And that he prefers people who have worked as bouncers in a sex club or as wardens in a lunatic asylum as they've experienced the raw, stark naked quality of life. His film lessons range from how music functions in a film to the creation of your own shooting permits. What else goes on in this film school seems to be clouded in secrecy, other than when in 2018, Herzog held a 12-day workshop with new filmmakers in the Amazonian rainforest where they made their own short films, molding the next generation of Werner Herzogs. And that's about everything. Thanks for watching. We really hope you enjoyed this lengthy, complimentary piece to our Klaus Kinski video. What are some of your favorite Werner Herzog moments? Leave your comments down below. We've also officially launched a Patreon for those who want to support us further and gain access to some really cool perks. We'll be very active on there and have some awesome ideas for it in the future. But until next time, have a good one.